education and technology education. I was one of the teachers involved on the ground floor by creating and editing test items and field, trust, field testing the pre-test in my classes based on an assessment blueprint. During the next 30 minutes or so, I will be discussing the role of assessment blueprints when creating pre- and post-assessments. I will also be giving a couple of examples of how you might want to package your pre- and post-assessments for students and administrators. More specifically, by the end of this webinar, my hope is that you'll be able to answer these six questions. What is an assessment blueprint? Why create assess an assessment blueprint for pre- and post-assessments? What are the components of an assessment blueprint? How do I create an assessment blueprint? Why be concerned about packaging my pre- and post-assessments? How can I package my pre- and post-assessments for my students and administrators? Before I continue, I need to let you know that for the purpose of this webinar, the information and examples I'm sharing will be those that have been successful with my business, facts, technology, and health teachers at Burn Hill, Boston Lake as they create their pre- and post-assessments. Most of the examples can be modified for other districts, but the most important thing to keep in mind is that information, formats, and assessment interests instruments may differ from district to district. What your district requires trumps any examples or information that I share with you today. Okay, on to the blueprint. What is an assessment blueprint? When creating any assessment, the first step is to prepare a blueprint. An assessment blueprint provides the content and structure of an assessment. It identifies the most important learning to be taught and measured. In other words, a blueprint includes each standard or unit or topic taught, how much time was spent teaching each standard or unit or topic, and the proportionate number of questions that should be on the assessment to measure students' understanding of each, of each standard. In addition, levels of question difficulty can also be identified in the blueprint. These are based on Bloom's taxonomy. I'll go into that a bit later. A blueprint is typically graphically represented as a matrix or a chart indicating the total number of questions or tasks in an assessment within each standard or unit or content topic. There are many different types of blueprints. The higher the stakes are for the assessment, the more detailed the blueprint needs to be. Take, for example, the regents' exams that have been given for years. The consequences for students not doing well on the assessment may be as critical as not graduating. Therefore, the blueprints are more specific as to what needs to be taught and the proportionate number of questions on the assessment than, let's say, for a unit test. Some blueprints even include the item types and the point values for each item. There are also different formats of blueprints. PARC has recently released a set of tests specification documents, including assessment blueprints, to help teachers better understand the design of the park assessment. In addition, evidence statement tables and evidence statements are included as part of the test specification documents. They describe the knowledge and skills that um, an assessment item or task elicits from the student. These are aligned directly to the Common Core State Standards. Very detailed indeed. Why create assessment blueprints? An assessment blueprint is essential because it helps identify the most important learning that is to be taught and in the end measured. Creating and following an assessment blueprint will make the assessment more valid for students. In other words, the assessment will better test students on information you taught and what you wanted them to learn. Making sure that your assessment is assessing what you want it to assess is going to give you a better idea if your students did learn what you wanted them to learn. This is validity. That's what great teaching is all about. It also keeps us honest. An assessment blueprint is created prior to creating the assessment. Instead of creating an assessment based on what questions we think are best, or the number of questions based on what units or topics we enjoy teaching the most, we're assessing what we taught. 
and the number of questions are based on how long we taught each unit or topic or standard. Thirdly, the graphic gives you and others reviewing your assessment the immediate methods that you have thought about the creation of your assessment regarding its validity, levels of questions, etc., for evaluating your student's growth and achievement prior to creating the assessment. That is so important for everyone to do, but it certainly does give others not familiar with our discipline more of a professional view of our curriculum, our instruction, and our assessment. It lets others know that we are also knowledgeable and dedicated to data-driven instruction. But lastly, it makes item writing easier. Since the blueprint is created prior to the assessment, you will know exactly how many items you will need to have on your assessment. This saves valuable time. In a perfect world, the blueprint should be created for each assessment given to students, but that's almost impossible. So the higher the stakes are for the students who are not successful on the assessment, the more important it is to have an assessment blueprint. Number three, what are the components of a typical assessment blueprint? Although there are many different kinds um, and types and formats, a typical blueprint includes six components. First, a list of standards or units or topics that comprise the course. I'm going to use the word standards and units and topics interchangeably during the webinar so I don't have to constantly say standards and or units and or topics. Next, a blueprint includes the amount of time spent in a course teaching each of the standards. For example, the number of hours or weeks in a course. The next component is the percentage of time spent in a course teaching each of the standards. For example, if you spend five weeks out of a 20-week course on a specific standard, then the percentage of time would be 25% of the course is spent on that standard. The next component is the percentage of questions for each standard that should be on the assessment. This percentage should be the same as the percentage of time spent teaching that standard during the 20-week course that I mentioned above. If 25% of the time is spent teaching to standard one, then 25% of the assessment needs to be on measuring students learning of standard one. These percent, the next um, component Okay, is when we need to convert these percentages to the number of questions that should be on the assessment for each standard. For example, let's just say you would like to create a 40-question pre-assessment. If you spend 25% of the time in your class on standard one, then 25% of the questions on your pre-assessment need to be based on that standard. That converts into 10 questions out of 40 for that standard. The next part of the blueprint is where you list the exact number of questions that you plan on including on the assessment for each standard. Let's say on a pre-assessment, calculations show that 7.5 questions are needed to be included for standard one. This can be interpreted as anywhere between seven and eight questions. For this component, you list the exact number of questions you plan on including in your assessment. And the last component on a typical assessment blueprint is when you identify the levels of questions you plan on including on your assessment according to Bloom's taxonomy. Okay, so how exactly do I start to create a, an assessment blueprint? To demonstrate how to create an assessment blueprint, I'm going to use an example from the new engineering by design curriculum. It is a national STEM-focused curriculum based on the ITEEA standards. Last year, New York State became part of the national consortium, and we began implementing this curriculum as our middle-level technology edu education program in Burn Health this year. This is an example of a simple chart that includes all the necessary components of a basic assessment blueprint. The column at the left shows the standards taught in the course. In order to keep this chart within one slide, I've grouped the standards and labeled them as to the standard category specified in the engineering by design curriculum. Obviously, on a real blueprint, whatever standards are taught, a separate row would be designated for each standard. Across the top are the blueprint components I just explained. The amount of time spent on the standard in the course, 
the percentage of time spent on the standard, the percentage of questions that need to be on the assessment for each standard, the number of questions that need to be on the assessment, and the exact number of questions that will be on the assessment. Here's an example of how much time is spent on each standard category out of a 20-week course. Three weeks on standards one through three, four weeks out for standards four through seven, et cetera, for a total of 20 weeks. These are just made up um, time, time frames. As you can see in this next slide, the amount of time spent in the course on each standard category has been converted to the percentage of time spent on each during a 20-week course the percentages need to total up to 100%. In the next column, you see that the percentage of questions written for each standard category on the assessment needs to be the same as the percentage of time spent on teaching each of the standard categories. Again, adding up to 100%. The second to the last column indicates the number of recommended questions for each standard based on the percentages listed. So out of a 50 question pre-assessment, 15% of the questions need to be on the standard category, the nature of technology. That converts to 7.5 questions. We can interpret that as being between 7 and 8. The last column shows how many questions the teacher has decided on including for each standard category on the 50 question pre-assessment. I also mentioned that another component of a typical assessment blueprint includes the number of questions on the assessment that fall into each of Bloom's, each level of Bloom's taxonomy. More detailed blueprints would require you to indicate how many questions at each of Bloom's levels you plan on including for each standard. For our purposes, we're going to look at how many questions at each level are on the assessment as a whole. You will notice that the names of the levels are a bit different than those you may remember. Remembering, understanding, applying, rather than knowledge, comprehension, and application, etc. Very, very briefly, okay, a little bit about how this, this taxonomy has changed. Benjamin Bloom created his first version of the classification of intellectual behavior important in learning in 1956. During the 1990s, a new group of cognitive psychologists led by one of Bloom's former students, Lauren Anderson, and one of Bloom's partners, David Craftwall, began updating the taxonomy to reflect relevance to 21st century work. This graphic shows the original and the revised version. There are basically three major differences. There is a change from noun, the old version, to verbs, the new version. The top two levels are essentially exchanged for the traditional to the new version. And the noun synthesis has been replaced with the verb creating. In 2007, Andrew Churches took the process of updating Bloom's work one step further when he introduced Bloom's digital taxonomy. His intent was to marry Bloom's cognitive level to 21st century digital skills. Okay, so let's try a few. As we all know so well, alternate assessment instruments such as performance tasks, laboratory experiences, novel and multiple step problems, and portfolios to name a few, are useful methods to assess, assess higher order thinking skills such as analyzing, evaluating, and creating. Since many teachers use multiple choice questions for at least part of their pre, post, pre and post assessment, let's try to identify the category in Bloom's revised taxonomy um, for some multiple choice questions and see what category we think they fall into. Okay, the first one. At what level of Bloom's taxonomy, either the original or the revised, do you think this question is assessing? What is the major role 
of protein in the body. This is a knowledge level question. It requires remembering that protein builds and repairs muscle. How about another? Mercedes is redecorating a small bedroom using an accented neutral color scheme. She has purchased a bright colorful picture and a cream colored bedspread with matching curtains. Which color combination of carpeting and wall paint would best complete the accented neutral color scheme? This question is most likely assessing students applying learned material. The student must know what an accented neutral color scheme is and then figure out that the light beige carpet and off-white painted walls would complete the scheme. All of this within the context of a real life situation. Here's another. The type of person who would most likely be successful working with elders is one who This question requires understanding on the part of students. Students need to be able to compare different character traits and then determine which would have the most positive impact on elders. In this situation, it is assumed that a person who recognizes that elders have individual talents and personality would be most successful with wor working with them. Here's a great question from one of my high school health teachers. Use the graph below to answer the question. Which statement best describes the graph? I'll give you a couple minutes to take a look. I'm sure you'll agree that this is a pretty great question as far as multiple choice questions are concerned. Under the original taxonomy, this question would be categorized as application due to the interpretation of the chart. But according to the revised version, the skill of interpreting is only at the understanding level. Either way, it's the type of multiple choice question that gets students to think way beyond simply remembering facts, and I feel is much more enjoyable to try to answer. Okay, which is an example of accented of an of accent lighting? This question comes from an assessment for uh, an assessment for the pre-assessment of a housing and environment course at the high school. This question asks students to select the example of accent lighting, the comprehension or the understanding level, depending on what version you're citing, is the best. Level. <clears throat> Here's another question um, from the same health teacher. Use the graph below to answer the question. According to the graph and application of your health knowledge, which statement is most logical? This question asks students to break concepts apart, information on the chart and information learned in class, and determine how the parts relate to each other. In other words, this question is assessing students' ability to analyze. Option four is the correct answer. Okay, so what does a student have to be able to do in order to answer this question? The approval to start construction granted from a local government is called. This simply asks students to remember that a building permit is the local government's approval um, needed to start construction. The level, remembering. How about this one? Which two principles of design best are best exemplified in this work of art? 
Well, first, students first need to be able to distinguish between principles and elements of design. Next, students need to be able to analyze this work of art to find the principles of design. American Gothic is an excellent example of the use of symmetrical balance and rhythm by repetition and gradation. This question allows te the teacher to evaluate student skill at analyzing. Okay, how about something about nutrition? The food with the label above is a good choice for an active athlete because it is this question requires students to know the functions of protein, sodium, saturated fat, and fiber in the body. It also requires students to determine which of those um, nutrients an active athlete may need. Lastly, students then need to combine all of that knowledge and analyze the label. In this case, the 24 grams of protein would be the best. Yes, although more fiber is useful in our diet, students need to know that one gram really isn't that much fiber. Here's a financial literacy question from one of my middle school facts teachers. Using the earning statement to answer the following questions, use the earning statement to answer the following questions. After deductions are subtracted, what is John's take-home pay? And what is the total amount of income John earned so far this year before deductions were taken out of this pay period, taken from this pay period? To understand these two questions correctly, students need to understand that take-home pay is net pay and what gross year-to-date pay means. Students then need to interpret the information found on the earnings statement to answer the question. Although the level is not a very high level, it's an excellent question to measure students' understanding. I think you'll agree that the questions with graphics, no matter what level, are so much more interesting for students to answer. And this is the last one. Based only on the qualifications given, who would most likely, who would probably make the best president of Junior National Honor Society? Again, this question takes an application question a step further. Students need to analyze each student's positive qualities and determine which one would be most effective in the role of what a president of, national, of Junior National Honor Society is supposed to do. This requires the skill of analyzing information. Okay, so this is the part of the blueprint that you would complete prior to creating the question and all of the levels are listed. Under higher level, really the only types of multiple choice questions um, that would fit into there, the only level would be um, for analyzing. As I mentioned before, uh, once we get into creating and evaluating, we mostly use performance tasks. So here's a look at what our blueprint um, was a little while ago with all our total number of questions. And this is what it would look like in totality after the levels of questions are included. I made up these numbers. They have nothing to do with the questions I just read to you. But you can see that there should be more um, application questions and analysis questions than we're probably used to including. We need to include more assessment questions or types of assessments where we can assess higher order thinking skills to better prepare our students for college, careers, and life. Here's a very useful framework that some of you might be very familiar with regarding higher standards and student achievement. It's called the Rigor and Relevance Framework and was developed by the International Center for Leadership and Education. It can be used as a tool to examine curriculum instruction curriculum instruction and assessment. There is Bloom's taxonomy of knowledge continuum on the left and a continuum of application of knowledge across the bottom of the graphic. We should try to plan more curriculum, instruction, and assessment 
in the D quadrant where the upper level knowledge meets the highest level of application. This is known as adaptation. More information about this model can be found on the CTE Technical Assistance Center website listed at the end of this webinar. Now on to a, just a bit about packaging pre and post assessment. Why should I be concerned about how I package my pre and post assessments? Well, first of all, we all want our students to take our pre and post assessment seriously. Students now take pre and post assessments in many of their courses, and we want ours to be taking as seriously as they take our academic counterparts' pre and post assessments. If we are truly going to make data-driven decisions, we need to have accurate data. That includes an accurate baseline score on pre-assessments from our students. Here are some of the things that the CTE and health teachers do at Burn Hill to try to help students take their pre- and post-assessments seriously. First of all, one way to package our pre- and post-assessments. Okay, department-wide, we, um, we put together packages for our students. It includes a cover specific to the department, directions, and then the pre- or the post-assessment. Here's an example of what the facts pre- and post-assessments would look like. It includes, this is the cover sheet that goes on top of the directions and the pre- or post-assessment. It's got uh, the district title, department, the year, the New York State Family and Consumer Sciences logo, the course title, the length of the course, the pre- or post-assessment identified, the student's name, period, teacher, and date of the assessment. Here's one that was created by our health teachers. Okay? They created their own BHBL health education logo, and that's what their cover sheet looks like. Business education has their logo, and technology education has their specific logo, too. But all the cover sheets have the same information. You don't have to read this in detail, but basically what I did was modify the direction sheet that was from the New York State proficiency examinations I mentioned earlier in the webinar. Okay? It has a little bit about what the pretest, the purpose of it is, and how many questions, and then there's a sample. All the teachers read the directions with their classes and go through the sample, and then they mark it on their, their Scantron sheet. It also indicates that the grade does not count as a grade for the course. Now, for the administrators, if they um, do indeed collect um, your pre- and or post-assessments, okay, that package can also look just as professional. It adds the cover. It includes the blueprint, which is not given to the student the direction sheet that is given to the student, the assessment, and then if there's any plan on how you created the assessment, district, regionally, et cetera, or a proctoring and scoring plan, like maybe your colleagues are going to score your assessments, it's nice to include a little information about that also for your, for your administrator. So, hopefully, okay, you're able now to answer the following questions. What is an assessment blueprint? Why create an assessment blueprint for pre- and post-assessment? What are the components of an assessment blueprint? How do I create an assessment blueprint? Why be concerned about packaging my pre- and post-assessment? And what is one way I can package my pre- and post-assessment for students and administrators? For additional information, here are a couple of, of uh, resources for you. The New York State CTE Technical Center, which is sponsoring this webinar. Uh, Engage New York, that has everything that you need to know about um, SLOs, APPR, and all the other um, things that are going on now. Uh, the Anderson and Karth Wall, which is the revision of Bloom's taxonomy. Any other types of assessments 
especially state and national assessments um, to look up what their blueprints look like, and then of course your professional association. Okay, here we go. We now have some time for questions. Attendees, if you have any questions, please enter them now for Ree. We have a few that came in during the webinar. So Ree, the first question that came in was about how long does it take to do a blueprint? Uh, let's see. How long does it take? Well, it varies. The amount of time would depend on a couple of factors. Um, first of all, is the blueprint for a unit assessment or for, um, let's say, a summative assessment at the end of a course. Um, obviously, a unit assessment would take less time than um, an assessment that you were trying to create for an entire course or blueprint. Uh, the second thing is um, whether you already know the amount of time that you spend on all of, um, of the standards, teaching the standards and topics or topics in your course. Um, obviously, if you already know how much time you spend or should spend, um, that will cut down a lot on the amount of time that you'll need to create the blueprint. Um, also, what, is, what level of uh, consequence will the outcome of the assessment have for your students? I mentioned earlier that, um, that the park assessments have very, very extensive um, blueprints. Um, for a final exam for a course, uh, obviously, a less less detailed um, blueprint would be necessary. Um, and if it was for um, even a quiz, if you want to do a blueprint for a quiz, that would um, take even less time. And the last thing is who's creating the blueprint. Um, if you're working with a team of teachers teaching the same course, it will be much easier, less time consuming. Um, it will be more fun if you consider making blueprint fun, which I do, and more um, valid because of the number of high-performing teachers that are at the table. And um, I, I must note that this is where uh, networking with your colleagues in your department, um, in your region, and in your state is, is so beneficial. Um, this is especially true if you're the only teacher in your discipline in your school or the only one teaching a specific course in your department. Um, I can't I can't stress that enough. Great, Ree. The next question that's coming is, can I use the same blueprint for more than one course? Can I use the same blueprint for more than one course? Um, well, I'm going to give a two-part answer to that. Um, you can use the same blueprint template for the assessments of different courses, where um, the chart that I showed you. Uh, the simple template that I spoke about today is, um, is the one that my teachers use. But you can't use the same blueprint for assessments for different courses. Um, the blueprint needs to reflect the information taught in that course and the proportionate number of questions um, for each unit or standard on the assessment. So you can see how each blueprint would be different. Um, another thing, if next year in the same course you spend a different amount of time on a particular standard um, or standard, then the blueprint will even change year to year to reflect those changes. Okay, and the last question, unless someone sends one in before the conclusion of the webinar, is why should I go through the trouble of creating a blueprint? I've never made one before for my exams, and I think my assessments have been pretty good. Well, um, as I mentioned before, uh, it's, it's so worth going through the trouble. Um, I'm sure that there are zillions of other reasons, but let me just touch on, on four that I mentioned earlier. Um, first of all, it's just good teaching, uh, making sure that your assessment is really measuring what you wanted to measure is going to give you a better idea if your students did learn what you wanted them to learn. Um, and that is validity. Um, great is better than pretty good. And isn't that what teaching is all about, just getting better and better? Secondly, it keeps us honest. 
um, like I mentioned earlier, instead of um, you know writing questions on things that we think are important for students to know or on topics that we enjoy teaching the most, um, it really keeps us keeps us on track. Thirdly, the graphic gives uh, you and others reviewing your assessment um, of the professionalism that you've um, spent or that you're showing in the creation of your pre and your post assessment. Um, and we can never get too much of that. Um, and I'll tell you one thing, once you create your assessment based on a blueprint, especially for uh, a final assessment, a summative ass assessment for a course, you will, you will never not do one again because you see um, how great of a pre and a post assessment that you created um, based on that information. Great. Thank you, Ray. It doesn't appear as if we have any other questions at this time, so that concludes today's webinar blueprints for pre and post assessments, which will be available for viewing at nyctecenter.org within 72 hours. Thanks again to Reese Basilico and those of you who attended, and we look forward to you joining us in the future for more webinars. Thank you and have a great evening.